the agenda for the rest of the morning. Uh, we're going to have some updates on colorectal cancer screening and surveillance. And we're going to have a state-of-the-art lecture. It's going to be virtual from Tony Lembo. And then during lunchtime, this will convert into a uh, product theater for a lecture by Sammy Saab with lunch. Uh, people are welcome to stay for that. If you prefer to take your food and eat outside, please do that. But this will be a lecture hall during uh, the noon hour. Um, any other housekeeping items, Tom or somebody remind me? If not, we're going to get started. Oh, one last thing. Did, did we find the cell phone holder? We have a missing bright green cell phone holder with a little, what do you call it, Eric? Pop-up? Pop, -up? pop, socket. pop socket. A pop socket on the back that one of our speakers is missing. So if you find it, please give it to me, Eric, or somebody else here. Thank you. So for our next session, uh, colorectal cancer screening and surveillance, uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome a fellow Midwesterner, a Michigan grad, um, and an assistant professor now at the University of Washington in Seattle. Rachel Asaka is going to give us an update on colorectal cancer screening and surveillance from DDW. Rachel, thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, so before we get started, let me see if I can... There we go. All right. Um, those are my financial disclosures. And what I hope to do today is review some colorectal cancer screening tests, um, what's available right now, as well as the current recommendations on test use, um, describe some of the DDW abstracts, and we'll really focus on the non-invasive CRC screening tests since that's where there's been a lot of recent movement. Um, briefly, we'll review the 2020 um, U.S. Multi-Society Task Force polypectomy surveillance guidelines and then discuss some emerging topics on surveillance as well presented from DDW. So as you all know, colorectal cancer is preventable, but yet it's the second leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States. This year alone, an estimated 150,000 individuals will be diagnosed with colorectal cancer, and approximately a third of those 53,000 individuals will die from this disease. We believe this is in large part due to lack of screening, with currently about 35% of adults ages 50 to 75 in the United States never having completed screening. Currently, there are many different options and modalities to complete colorectal cancer screening, including the Guaiac fecal occult blood test, the fecal immunochemical test, the multi-target stool DNA test, capsule endoscopy, and CT colonography, and of course, the direct visualization tests, including colonoscopy and flexible sigmoidoscopy. So, you know, immediately one might ask, what then is the best test, given that there are so many options? The U.S. Multi-Society Task Force has um, grouped these different tests into tiers. And in tier one, they recommend colonoscopy to be completed every 10 years with an annual fecal immunochemical test um, as also another test in that top tier. In tier two is CT colonography every five years, uh, uh, the FIT DNA test every three years, um, or flexible sigmoidoscopy every five to 10 years. Capsule endoscopy is in tier three, which should be completed every five years when being used for screening purposes. And the U.S. Multi-Society Task Force does not recommend SEPTA-9, which is the serum-based colorectal cancer screening test. When we look at the U.S. Preventative Service Task Force, and this is pulled from their most recent guideline that was published about a month ago, um, they say that the risks and benefits of different screening tests vary and that due to limited evidence, the USPSTF recommendation does not include serum tests, urine tests, or a capsule endoscopy for colorectal cancer screening. So as you can already tell, depending on what guideline you're following, um, the recommendations do vary. What they put in their most recent guidance statement is that individuals should have a high sensitivity guaiac fecal cold blood test or FIT every year, stool DNA um, FIT, uh, FIT test every one to three years, and we can talk about this a little bit more later, CT colonography every five years, Flexig every five years, Flexig every five years plus annual FIT, or a colonoscopy every 10 years. So just to briefly review the performance characteristic of the fecal immunochemical test. 
So in this study by um, Jeff Lee et al. that was published in Annals in 2014, um, they, he did a, a systematic review and a meta-analysis of existing fecal immunochemical tests on the market at that time. And compared to colonoscopy, one-time um, one fit testing compared to colonoscopy for the detection of colorectal cancer has a sensitivity of 79% and a specificity of 94%. And this is based on most, um, most of the commercially available FIT tests in the United States uh, detect positivity at 20 micrograms per gram of stool. There was a more recent systematic review and meta-analysis completed by um, Tom Imperiali and his colleagues in which they looked at a cutoff of 10, grams, 10 micrograms per gram of stool and in fact found um, a 91% sensitivity and 90% specificity for fit detecting colorectal cancer um, um, in those studies. So here is an abstract from um, TR11 and his group from Kaiser. And what they were looking at is because this health system primarily uses fecal immunochemical tests for colorectal cancer screening, they looked at um, sort of how the impact of um, COVID uh, affected their use of FIT tests for colorectal cancer screening. And they compared three different time periods. So specifically looking at um, 2018, 2019, and 2020. And what they found was that overall, the number of FIT tests that were distributed to individuals within those healthcare system, their healthcare system over those three different year periods was pretty similar. So around one to um, 1.2 million individuals who were um, eligible and um, could be screened. And um, what they essentially found, however, was that overall, fewer people were returning their FIT test specifically due to COVID-19. So in that April, May, um, in that March, April time period of 2020, compared to similar time phase in 2019 and 2018, um, overall there was about a 9% lower uh, return of their FIT kits. Um, but what they found was that when they looked ahead, so by the end of May of 2020, that they had essentially caught up. Um, Overall, they said that there was about a 6% decrease in screening up to dateness, again, looking at 2020 compared to the years prior, um, and that there were no differences by sociodemographic groups. Keep in mind that this is an integrated healthcare system that has been using FIT-based screening since 2012, and so they're really a well-run, oiled machine um, to be able to sort of pick up that um, slack in such a short time period. I'll show you some data um, later on in my state of the art on colorectal cancer that shows how um, the pandemic and FIT in particular was specifically affected across different types of healthcare systems. So next I wanna talk a little bit more about the multi-target uh, multi stool DNA. Um, so we know that colorectal cancer is associated with genetic changes and that colorectal cancers um, can shed um, into the stool and that their, um, DNA, their DNA alterations can be detected. Um, so the multi-target stool DNA is a test that contains an assay for mutant KRAS and also methylated um, regions that are associated with colorectal cancer carcinogenesis. Um, when we look at the performance of the FIT DNA compared to FIT, you can see here that the sensitivity is higher because again, you're combining these two tests, which is the fecal immunochemical test and the DNA. So the sensitivity is 92% compared to 79%. Um, the specificity, however, is lower. And this is one of the challenges with the multi-target stool DNA test is that there is a higher rate of false positivities. So specificity is 94% in FIT and 87% in the FIT DNA. The test interval for FIT is annual, as I mentioned, and the FIT DNA in their landmark and New England um, Journal of um, Study, they published on a, a three-year interval. I mentioned to you that the USPSTF um, in their most recent guidance said that this test should be done every one to three years. And that's really because a lot of that, um, those guidelines are informed by modeling data and they could not detect a benefit modeling the use of this test every three years, but could see a benefit when it was modeled for yearly use. So that is something that we'll have to, con to contend with, but you know, just to keep in mind. And then the cost difference is obviously substantial as you can see there.
Um, so again, just summarizing all of the different guidelines and sort of how they approach the multi-target stool DNA, um, USPSTF in this year says yes, recommend for screening. They say to start at age 45, again the testing interval as I mentioned. ACG in 2021 also says yes at 45, but a three-year interval. And there's a caveat that this should be used for folks who are unwilling to complete colonoscopy. NCCN, which um, I should disclose I'm part of that um, uh, body of, gui of uh, guideline um, committee, um, we also say yes to the multi-target stool DNA, starting at age 50, however, with an interval of every three years. The American College of Physicians does not recommend um, this test for screening purposes. Um, and then finally, the American Cancer Society and the U.S. Uh, Multi-Society Task Force both recommend it um, at different starting ages. Um, and again, as I highlighted, the U.S. Multi-Society Task Force says that this should be a, a second tier option. So next I want to review this poster that was also presented at DDW um, from church and colleagues um, looking at data from Texas. And this is a large conglomerate private practice group in the state of Texas. And what they wanted to determine was essentially whether or not providers were um, ordering this test appropriately. And so looking over a time period from um, 2015 until 2019, they looked at the number of individuals who were 45 years or older who had had this test ordered for colon cancer screening purposes. And overall, um, there were about um, a little over a thousand um, tests that they found. Um, importantly, they observed that about um, 35% of these tests were inappropriately ordered. And what that meant was that these, um, the multi-target stool DNA test was being ordered in folks who had a history of polyps, who had a family history of cancer, or who were symptomatic. So meaning that these were individuals that should in fact have been recommended or referred for colonoscopy, but these tests were being ordered. Um, and then they also found that a substantial portion of the tests that were ordered were really due to patients requesting this test. Um, and so physicians were documenting that they did not think that it was appropriate, but again, still were handing um, these tests out to patients. What, what they did find was, you know, when they looked at um, the positivity rate, that overall about two and a half percent of those who tested positive with this test ultimately had colorectal cancer, which was on par with what Tom Imperiali and um, his colleagues presented in their landmark trial. And so really the take home from this abstract was that while the multi-target stool DNA can identify patients at risk for colorectal cancer, um, that really gastroenterologists should remain cognizant of its appropriate use and whenever possible try to um, counsel patients against the inappropriate use of this test. And then the final abstract I want to present regarding non-invasive screening tests is um, on the blood-based tests. If you recall, I mentioned that the um, U.S. Multi-Society Task Force does not recommend this currently, um, but as many of you may know, that this is a really rapidly evolving field. Um, so we wanted to share um, this poster because you know, certainly this recommendation could change. So uh, this um, poster abstract was from Peter Liang, who's at NYU, and um, his colleagues. And they did a randomized control trial looking at individuals who had refused colonoscopy or the fecal immunochemical test for colorectal cancer screening. They had approximately 360 individuals, and they randomized them to a control group where um, they didn't receive the serum test or the intervention group in which they um, you know, offered the serum test in addition to other colorectal cancer screening tests. And what they found was that overall in that control group of approximately 180 individuals, that about um, 19 uh, individuals went on to complete screening. The majority, again, just refused screening and didn't com ever complete it. Whereas within the intervention group, um, about 33 individuals, which came up to about 18%, ultimately completed screening using a combination of modalities, um, but looking specifically at the stool-based test, um, about uh, 6% of individuals completed screening using that serum test. 
And so their take home, you know, really was that when you offer the stool-based test as part of a panel of tests for individuals who refuse or are not interested in completing screening using these other modalities, that there is about a 7 to 8 percent difference in those who ultimately go on to complete colorectal cancer screening. This was statistically significant at a p-value of 0.04, and so really they're, what they're saying is, again, for those who don't want to complete screening using colonoscopy or stool-based or stool testing, that this should be, um, the blood-based colorectal cancer screening test should be offered as an option. Ultimately, the most important thing that should happen whenever there is a non-invasive test used is that any abnormal result should, you know, lead to a colonoscopy. And this is an, an area of interest of mine and, and uh, an area that we conduct research in trying to understand why, you know, up to 50% of people with abnormal um, non-invasive uh, screening tests never go on to complete a colonoscopy. While there are no head-to-head -head trials that have compared specifically the fecal immunochemical test and colonoscopy. There are um, four large randomized control trials that are currently ongoing, um, and we should have data on those results in the next five years or so. So now I'm going to pivot to um, talk about some of the DDW abstracts that focused on colorectal cancer surveillance, um, polypectomy surveillance. So just as a refresher, in 2020, um, led by Samir Gupta and colleagues, um, the U.S. Multi-Society Task Force released an update to the polypectomy surveillance guidelines. And the most significant changes, um, before I get into that, what I really want to stress is that this, um, these guidelines are really only relevant when there's a high quality colonoscopy performed. And so that means that it was completed to the cecum, there was adequate bowel prep, um, that you know, they, the individual performing it had an adequate adenoma detection rate, and there was um, complete polyp resection. And if all of those conditions are met, then when you look at these updated guidelines, there are really four significant changes. The first being that they increase the surveillance of low-risk adenomas from five to 10 years to seven to 10 years. They created a little bit of wiggle room for those um, you know, three to four lower-risk adenomas, and then really stressed um, close follow-up for high-risk adenomas, so this three-year um, follow-up category. And then there was also more specific guidance for sessile serrated polyps as well as hyperplastic polyps. In this updated guideline, what they found was that if your baseline um, colonoscopy found no adenomas, then the proportion of individuals that went on to develop metachronous advanced neoplasias was around 3%. If your baseline colonoscopy found one to two adenomas that were less than 10 millimeters, then the proportion that went on to develop these metachronous lesions was about 5%. And if you had a high-risk adenoma, that number shot up to about 17%. But, you know, as Samir, you know, highlighted during DDW, the, there are certainly challenges with these surveillance guidelines, and mainly that the current guidelines are not precise. So the sensitivity that they found ranges from 59 to 81% as far as predicting who will develop metachronous um, neoplasias, and the specificity is 43 to 58%. So a really wide range. Um, this leads to under surveillance of low risk individuals and over surveillance of high risk individuals. And right now, the po post polypectomy surveillance guidelines are really only based on the number of polyps that are found, the size, and the histology. So in response to this, his group presented work that um, tried to use a, a, develop a prediction model for metachronous advanced neoplasia after polypectomy. And so the design was a, a retrospective national cohort of U.S. veterans that had been exposed to colonoscopy, and they were able to get data, complete data on them on demographics, comorbidities, their smoking status, medications, et cetera. And they were also able to extract data from past procedures that, that they had had completed. Um, in order for folks to be included, they needed to have a baseline polypectomy completed between 2004 and 2016, and this had to be either um, an adenoma or a sessile serrated adenoma, and it had to be um, more, they also had to have at least one surveillance colonoscopy after their baseline. And then um, those who didn't meet that criteria or who had a history of colorectal cancer or inflammatory bowel diseases were excluded. 
Their primary outcome of interest was um, detecting metachronous advanced neoplasia, which they defined as colorectal cancer, an adenoma that was greater than a centimeter, or tubulovillus adenomas. And in their analysis, they essentially split this data into a model a, that was the, um, the development sort of um, training data and then um, a test or validation set. And they identified two cutoffs that they wanted to achieve. So in addition to using size, location, et cetera, they also wanted to use some, some of these sociodemographic factors and behavioral risk exposures to develop uh, a new model that had a 10% improvement in sensitivity and specificity over the current US multi-society task force um, guidelines. Um, so they started with this cohort that was initially around 414,000 individuals after excluding folks who either didn't have that first um, or subsequent um, surveillance colonoscopy or their history. They ended up with around 30,000 individuals who met criteria. And as I mentioned, they split them into two groups, one to first develop the model and then the second to validate the model. And what they found was that, you know, of course, age um, was and all of those that are asterisked are the ones that are um, significant predictors in, de in determining who's gonna develop a metachronous lesion after their initial colonoscopy. So folks that had diabetes had a higher risk of developing um, a post-polypectomy metachronous lesion. Um, I mentioned already the number of adenomas is relevant. Um, male, um, gen male sex was associated with a higher rate of developing a post-polypectomy lesion. And then ADR, so um, those who were in the lowest quintile of ADR, those, pa um, those patients subsequently had a higher risk of developing a post-polypectomy um, lesion. And so after kind of going through this process of including these um, uh, patient uh, behavioral and sociodemographic factors that they found to be relevant, essentially their predictive model um, at two separate cutoffs um, performed better than the current US multi-society task force with an area under the curve of about 62%. And so really just sort of demonstrating that if we're able to incorporate more patient specific information that we might be able to better risk stratify our patients when we're giving them recommendations around when they need to return after uh, a surveillance colonoscopy. Next, I want to talk about um, a study that was um, uh, highlighted by Dr. Tanya Kaltenbach, who is um, at the VA as part of UCSF and her group. And what they were arguing for is that, you know, right now we use adenoma detection rate to really um, hone in on um, screening adenoma, like screening performance metrics. And so, you know, this, the adenoma detection rate as currently calculated um, means that, you know, that person had to be of screening age, um, that their bowel prep was complete, that, you know, they had an optimal study, and only those individuals who meet these very specific criteria can go into our calculation for the adenoma detection rate. Um, but they, in fact, argue that, you know, we should be able to apply this to all of the tests that we perform, and it actually does quite well. Um, so right now, just as a refresher, we know that the minimum um, ADR is greater than 25% um, for men and women. We know it should be greater than 30% for men and greater than 20% for women. And so what they did was they looked at approximately 3,000 colonoscopies, 21 endoscopists who are at two VA centers, and they essentially found no differences between screening ADR and non-screening ADR. They then did some simulations, sort of looking at a combination of um, ADRs that went into um, a, a calculation. So for instance, if 75% you know, um, of the tests that went into your ADR were for surveillance, or if 75% were for, from screening, and sort of um, played out you know, what the ADR would essentially look like and how that might differ between your screening ADR and your non-screening ADR. And essentially what they found was that the only one that really seemed to matter is this asterisk one here, which this um, was included individuals who um, the vast majority were in for surveillance, but for everyone else, it didn't really matter what the indication of the exam was. Um, reporting that total ADR um, seemed to be really consistent with what their screening ADR would be alone. So really just highlighting that we should perhaps consider getting into the habit of not reporting just screening ADR, but ADR in general, and using that as a way to measure quality, um, especially when it comes to um, colonoscopy and, and surveillance.
And so they, she recommended you know, some tips um, for high quality colonoscopy, um, broken down into mindset technique and tools. And so just knowing the signature features of the adenomas and serrated lesions, looking for subtle lesions, thinking flat and depressed, which tends to be more of what we find now, maintaining a straight scope, cleaning the mucosa, looking behind folds, expanding and collapsing the lumen, taking adequate time but being efficient with the plan, spending most of the time in the right colon and even um, advocating for examining the right colon twice, um, knowing when you need to adjust lighting cap, um, chromoendoscopy, and then um, measuring these um, quality metrics for your group and tracking them over time. And I think this is really important, um, you know, as highlighted in this study, which um, is looking at individuals who this is a study by Kaswani et al. Um, at Northwestern, and what they did was essentially um, gave um, providers their colonoscopy metrics over a 23-month period. And they initially, you know, just sort of gave them the metrics at time point A, and then during this uh, second time period, um, they then started, um, this was after they gave them report cards, letting them know how they were doing as far as their adenoma detection rate and their withdrawal rate, et cetera. And then at this third time period, um, between two and three, they implemented an institutional quality sort of practice program. And so what you can see is, you know, by just simply giving people their score alone, that report card alone, you see overall a trend in improvement in um, overall uh, colonoscopy quality as measured by ADR. And then certainly after implementing this institutional quality practice, you see further increases. So none of this is inherent. It's taught. It can be improved. And it makes a, a significant difference in the lives of our patients. So I'll end with this. You know, when it comes to colon cancer screening and surveillance, um, Dr. Winauer's uh, words continue to ring true, which is the best test is the one that gets done and done well. Um, and so, you know, as endoscopists, this is something that we always have to keep in mind. And, and hopefully um, some of these DDW abstracts give you some additional tools and insights into our own daily practices. Thank you.